It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show, recorded and broadcast live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time in lovely Ann Arbor, Michigan at the Ann Arbor District Library, right on the corner of 5th and William. And uh, thank you, AADL.org, for letting us put on the show every week. And uh, my name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and a teaching artist. And with me today is a really, really awesome cartoonist who does comics for young people and the young at heart, Mark Mariano of mypalmark.com. Did I say your last name right? Or do I need yep. to put a little Mariano in there? Hey, either way, you know, <laughs> Mariano's fine. But thanks for having me, Jers. And uh, I got to say, like, the Ann Arbor is an awesome, awesome library. I, I just wish it was closer to uh, to me over here in Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're doing some really cool stuff here lately. Uh, AADL is an amazing organization. Uh, with all, we're going to have a, a calendar section up at the end of this episode with some of the exciting stuff that's coming up in the Ann Arbor area. But it just blows my mind how how much they're putting into their comics programming and comics events. And uh, I've made no secret of it. My personal goal is to uh, do what little I can to make Ann Arbor the place where all cartoonists want to live. Make it one, because you know, everybody talks about like, oh, you got to move to, what, 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 what are the towns? New York City, and then on the West Coast, what do you got? Is it San Diego, uh, San Francisco? San Fran, probably, yeah. Yeah, it's like, well, what, we need something like that in the Midwest. We need a destination for people, uh, for cartoonists to all live. So then I can just be around the best people in the world all the time. It's a totally selfish goal. <laughs> anyway, so um, mypalmark.com. Well, let's introduce yeah. you to the people before we d dig into topics. So you are the author of, which one should I do first, Happy Lou or Flabbergast? Yes, you go with Happy Lou. Happy Lou came first, right? Yes. Now, Happy Lou is your comic aimed at really young people. This is, um, I would put it on the same scale as like Owly by Andy yes. Runton. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, I'll let you explain the premise while I show the artwork to people. Sure, well, Happy Lou is a collection of eight short stories, and these are wordless comics. And each comic is followed by an uh, informational section that teaches arts and crafts and fun facts. I love this, yeah. So, like, you know, there's a whole sec section for real facts, sleds. There's no fun like snow fun. And, yeah, it's like, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you were a reader of Hot Dog Magazine back in the day? Actually, no, I never heard of it. Oh, it was sort of like, uh, it was like the the... Saturday morning, cool 80s kid version of Highlights Magazine, right? Oh, so it'd have, like, the interview with Scott Bayo, but then there would be all of these, like, joke pages and then, like, how to make, you know, a boat out of a milk carton kind of things in there. Oh, cool. Uh, totally my favorite magazine uh, when I was a kid. Uh, but, yeah, it also, I mean, visually, your style meshes really well with that uh, Hot Dog Magazine. You look it up on, on, on the Googles later on. There was a couple other ones. Yeah. I forget. Uh, if Sean Robert of BrandedInThe80s.com were here right now, uh, he would totally be able to tell me six other magazines that did the same thing. Right. But anyway, so uh, yes, let's read some of the characters in here, um, the names, because Meat Sauce is easily my favorite character name of all time. Yes, Meat Sauce, the bulldog. He uh, he's a big lover of food, and he's pretty much based on my dad because it's, it's <laughs> also what my dad talks about. It's funny. I, I had a, when I was still living with my parents, I had a Meat Sauce, you know, like a screensaver. And when it came up, my dad was like, hey, what am I doing on the computer? <laughs> so he, he knew that Meat Sauce was based on him. And um, you also have Tickle. He's the friendly turtle. He's yeah. always curious, and he's always there to help. And, of course, you got Cooley, who's the uh, very artistic panda. So, um, And, yeah. of course, Devin and, and Squirm, they are the pranksters of the bunch. You know, always, always trying to ruin the good fun for everyone. All of my favorite stories when I was growing up as a little kid, I mean, child of the 80s, you know, uh, you know, people, people ask me like, well, you know, Jersey, how could you have liked Strawberry Shortcake or Rainbow Bright or some of those, those were girl shows, right? And I was like, but they still had good guys and bad guys. You had the dreaded Purple Pie and a Porcupine Peak and you had right. uh, Murky and Lurky and Rainbow Bright. All of these shows, like they typically had uh, a good guy versus bad guy kind of thing. And I mean, in Happy Lou, you've got that a little bit, but they're more like, like sort of like rascals, more like... Um, Oh, who was that ghost in Casper the Friendly Ghost who was, like, the, the not-so-nice one? He wore, like, the bowler hat and the cigar. Oh, yeah. What was his name? I don't remember his name. Somebody's going to tell us in the chat. But, uh, but you know, there's always like, – you've got, like, rascally. They're not exactly bad. It's more like in um, 
or even like in Doug, the Nickelodeon cartoon, right? right? Like for what the bad guy in that was where was it Roger? Uh, Roger. Yeah, Roger. not not quite a bad guy. He's not all that right. bad, but he but he's he's a troublemaker. He's a, he's an Eddie Hassel kind of character. So it's yeah, sort that's of, it. They're they're just basically troublemakers. I mean, uh, Devin has his points where he does shine in the story, and he does realize. You know, he, he turns over a leaf for a, a portion of the of the story, but then again, at the very end, I just I just bring him back to the character that he is. You know, he is that prankster and uh, sort of a bully. You know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was I was having some conversations with people weeks ago, and I, you know, I haven't really dug at this very deeply, but bringing up the question whether or not is this, and I mean, I, I don't know about your background, but I am not a child behavior specialist or a child development specialist, but, you know, it, it, the chicken and egg comes up. Is Do kids respond to that out of the fact that that's what they're ready for, that developmentally that's where they are, like a, kind of a binary look at things, like are you being good or are you being bad, or are they reacting to the stories that we're writing anticipating that's what they want, right? Is it something where they could I accept a story where there was like a, a series of gray characters between two polar extremes? Uh, wh which is it? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but... that, that's definitely a good question. I mean, um, my wife, she's, she's a teacher. She teaches elementary school, so... Um, she had a bunch of books on childhood development, and I did did a lot of reading of that. And um, I don't know if subconsciously some of that went into the to the writing of the story. I mean, I didn't really. I guess when I first started writing some of the stuff for kids, I did try to do that, but then it seemed a little too preachy. So I just yeah. started writing what I what I wanted to read, you know, stuff that I would would enjoy. And so, yeah, I, it's a good question. I'm not sure if it's uh, if that's the way they are though. That, that, that's a really, I mean, that's kind of tangentially related to what we're talking about, but it's a great point is this is something I struggle with a lot is that like, you know, uh, when I write, I, I try to specialize in stories for young people and I thought, well, would it behoove me to bring in an education specialist or a psychologist to evaluate my materials and sort of put their stamp of approval on it in order to assuage any or in, in, anticipate a parent's fears, right? It's like, well, mm -hmm. here, I've got a stamp on this thing that says this is good for kids. Um, you know, like like going back to cartoons, the GI Joes had the PSAs where it said, you know, but from the National Child Safety Council, which right. kind of is a good way to make parents feel at ease about what their kids are watching. But then I think about, gosh, I don't want to put myself in a situation where I'm constantly anticipating what a parent might be afraid of. I really should just get into that mindset of thinking imaginatively and having fun with it, right. and, and things will line up. I mean, you know, as long as I'm not putting anything in there that is sinister or cynical, it should be okay. Uh, that's going to tie into something that we're going to talk about quite a bit when we get to flabbergast. But I did sure. want to touch, I want to take this opportunity to talk about um, PSAs, because <laughs> one of the things I love about Happy Lou is after the story, where, uh, you know, somebody cheats in the story, you do a think it through section. You want to tell everybody what this is, what this think it through section is? Right. Think it through is, is um, sort of help with the cognitive development. You know, it's uh, a lot of times, because um, Happy Lou is mainly aimed at younger readers to be read with their older siblings or older parent um, and to, be, to discuss it. And that's what think it through is. We'll touch on a theme that was featured in the story and then have the child, you know, think about it and discuss if they can write out, you know, what, what, what the answer would be to it. In this case, uh, Devin removed all the screws from, uh, from the sled race, from all the sleds, and he cheated to win, but he didn't win in the end. And so then the think it through for that is, you know, have you ever cheated? How did you feel? If you won, did it make you feel good? You know, is it a, is it a stolen victory? So, it's right, a, and you're getting kids to think about. It's not just about thinking about morality or thinking about good choices, bad choices. I mean, that's that's obviously that's a, a huge part of it. But right. it, it also gets them thinking about character choices, right? It's like one of the yes. things that I love about comics for young people is you have the opportunity to write. Here are your options, kids. In if you're going to start imagining what it's going to be like to be a grown up and interacting in a more, uh, you know, uh, autonomous way, here's the different options you have. And that's what, you know, when, why you write vibrant characters for young people. And just getting them to reflect on what happened in the story gets them thinking harder about not only, like, personal choices, but if they want to take this into a creative route, uh, character choices, creative choices, right? Absolutely. 
I mean, I, I know I said it on a past Comics Are Great is like when I was a kid and I would watch Saturday morning cartoons with my dad, one of the things that I think led me in the direction that I went is that he would talk with me about the episode and it wasn't about, you know, like trying to preach morality at me. It was just like, boy, it sure was neat when this happened. What do you think about that moment? What do you think about that moment? And just having like a genuine discussion on something that we really got a kick out of. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's definitely one of the things I try to do with uh, yeah. with though, is to, you know, have them share what happened in the story. I know another another one of the stories is uh, like the balloon flower, where at the end, um, their friend Cooley, it's the first first uh, story in there, their friend Cooley finds a flower and it says, what do you think happens next? You know, it's asking the kids to, to continue the story. You know, right, yeah. No, that's super cool. It's, it, and that's why I remember Hot Dog Magazine, because it did stuff <laughs> yeah. like that, right? I mean, it's just, it's just it shouldn't be... Uh, I don't think it can be overstated how important this can be, how uh, what kind of an effect it can have on a young reader when you do something yeah. like that, when you ask them to engage with the work like that, right. um, especially when you do it in like a super colorful way like you do. But but also, I mean, like it's just the, the thing that really grabbed me when I read that uh, Think It Through section was like, this is totally uh, the G.I. Joe knowing half the battle PSA. This is the He-Man closing moral at the end, which some people think is kind of corny, but I love it. I love it because <laughs> uh, another story I, I know I've told before, but it's probably been a long time is I took those morals so much to heart when I was a little kid, because I guess I was just super impressionable. Uh, they did an episode where it was about looking beyond surface features, right? Don't judge somebody by the way they look. That was the essential moral of the, the story. Yes. And so Tila comes on and she says, you know, sometimes good looking people can be really ugly on the inside and sometimes really ugly people can be beautiful on the inside. Well, I took that to mean that good looking people were bad on the inside. And so I went to my mom, I'm a little kid, one of my, like, well, actually I was like seven. Uh, and I go to my mom, I'm like, mom, am I good looking? She's like, of course you are. And I, started, <laughs> I started bawling. I was like, oh my God, I'm a bad person, as Tila said so. <laughs> so. So yeah, there's kids out there who are kind of uh, weak-willed like me. And uh, <laughs> and it's, it's our job sometimes when we're writing stories for them to keep that in mind. Um, Let's talk about Flabbergast a little bit. We'll introduce people to this book because this this book is, guys, this is where we're going to get, I think, the majority of our content today. Because sure. you did a lot of neat stuff in this book that I want to talk about. So Flabbergast is, oh man, you described it pre-show as your love note to all the cartoons that you grew up on. Absolutely. Yeah, it's my tribute to the to the cartoon cartoons I grew up on, including He-Man, including Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, I'd even say some G.I. Joe. Uh, you know, Transformers, there's, of course, you can have giant robots. That's right. um, and even some newer stuff like Avatar, Last Airbender. Um, but I think mainly it's weird the way Flabbergast came about is that I wanted to tell a zombie story <laughs> for kids. Right. You know, and it's something I've seen some zombie stories for kids, but it seems like they made the zombies either goofy or they dumbed it down. They didn't make it as much of a threat. I mean, Kids, a lot of times, well, you know how it is, Jersey, at, at these conventions we do, kids love zombies. I mean, they, you know, and and I wanted to do a story that, you know, without the gore or anything like that, but still tell the story of the zombies and the major threat that they that they can be. And and so it started out with that, and then I had a bunch of different ideas that I just wanted to uh, pack all together, all kinds of science fiction and fantasy, and just put it all all into one book. So the, the premise is is that it's these two, I don't want to call them losers, but they're not winners, right? They're just two average guys who... Two average guys, yeah. And one of them wants to be a ghost hunter. They yeah. act in one of his crazy attempts to find a new adventure. They trip upon this laboratory, which is basically like Umbrella Corps from uh, Resident <laughs> Evil, but, it's, a, but it, it's run by good people who are trying to stop a zombie outbreak, right? right? right. It's like a holding tank for zombies, and they screw some things up, and all heck breaks loose, uh, which leads to progressively more and more adventures uh, as they Absolutely. get more incorporated with this organization called Flabbergast. Um, I just want to get this premise out so people can like, get a grip on, okay, sure. why should I read it? Uh, <laughs> and this is what's going to lead into the larger topic today. Because, like, okay, so here's, here's, here's the topic that I wanted to broach with you as a guy who does what I do. Uh, one of the chief questions I get from people when I tell them that I, I won't do anything over PG-13, right? It's like, that's my limit. I won't draw or write anything that goes beyond that. What people accept is that sort of, like, a general sense what that rating is. And people say, well, gee, how do you censor yourself all the time like that? Uh, how do you how do you how do you simplify everything? How do you keep all your ideas dumbed down for little kids? And I'm like, oh, you know. 
Here's a story <laughs> where I'm going to spoil a couple things in this book, but I'm not spoiling the book because it's really good and people should read it. Two adventure scientists, mom and dad and their daughter, are running flabbergast, right? And the zombies get loose and they start biting. And the dad gets bitten and turns into a zombie. And then the mom says, I won't leave my husband. <laughs> and she gets bit. <laughs> And you show the biting. You sh and, and these are zombies. They're flesh-eating zombies in, in a kid's book. And uh, you, you're not actually showing them, like, you know, ripping zombies' heads off or anything. But it's a horrifying moment where the uh, – oh, I'm forgetting her name now. Um, Valerie? Valerie. Sorry. Uh, she's, she's like, you know, my parents are dead. They, they're turned into the undead. This is in a kid's book, right? I mean, it says right, right. on, right on the, uh, one of the chapter covers, this is ages 10 and up. So, you know, right. uh, lots of gross-out humor, puking in the story, farting yeah. in the story, which I'm looking at it going like a 10-year-old boy is going to love that stuff, right? Gross-out humor is always a hit. Garbage pill kids, anybody? Um, and then and i got to make a note of this, too. This isn't spoiling another thing, but, uh, but it, believe me, I'm not spoiling the book. I'm just giving you something to look forward to. Uh, at, at one point in the story, the parents, zombie parents, become conscious again through some means. They become themselves, but they're still zombies. Yeah, they, I, I refer to them as mindful zombies. Mindful zombies. <laughs> And they open up the Zombie Dead Life Paradise Resort for, to, to rehabilitate zombies, which, oh, man, and, and it's all, as I'm reading this. Turns them vegetarian, by the way. Oh, he turns them vegetarian, so they're not, yeah, they're not uh, flesh eaters anymore. And the, so this whole book is full of stuff that is just pushing the edges of what I think a parent would consider acceptable for kids. But at the same time. Kids, I work with kids all the time in workshops, and they draw this stuff all the time. I ask oh, kids yeah. to draw a story. It's like, oh, I'm going to draw a story about a guy who gets his head ripped off and blown up. You know, 10-year-old boy, that's what they want. That's what I was doing. I got a comic that I posted on my website, comicsagreat.com, where a guy gets a hole burned through his chest and drops dead, you know. That's mm -hmm. what you do when you're that age because you don't understand the consequences yet. It's uh, funny you say that, Jersey, because I have some of my old comics right here that I <laughs> that I drew. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that was one of the main things that I did when I was creating Flabbergast. I, I started thinking about, oh, well, maybe this is a little over the edge for, for a 10-year-old or for... Um, you know, for the age group. But then I thought back to my old comics that I did, and these are even more violent. Yeah. And I made these when I was about the same age that I'm, that I'm you know, that I'm aiming for. Yeah. I figured you get a kick out of this. I even had a foil cover on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that is so awesome. That, that's pre-foil cover, too. Yeah, seriously. All right, you started it. <laughs> and this character actually appears in Flabbergast. <laughs> He's a uh, um, one of the characters that I had when I was little, and I, I still he's still part of the part of my uh, lineup now. So it's it's great to have him back in the in the lineup. That is super cool too that you do that, and I want to talk about that more in a minute. I, but I want to get this idea of, you know, okay, so we already accept the fact that kids know about puking and <laughs> you know fart jokes and uh, and violence. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you not censor yourself, but how do you measure that stuff in, in a way, like what, uh, describe your inner barometer to fit this stuff in, in a way where it feels like it's still okay. Because you're talking about a zombie outbreak, you're talking about punching zombies, it's, there's like a, a robot apocalypse later on where robots versus zombies uh, on the roof of a building, and, and the robot even says, ah, they're zombies, that's great, they have brittle bodies, you know? <laughs> there's a lot of things that you imply in the story. I mean, how do you walk that line? How do you walk the line for writing for, for young people? Um, um, I still watch cartoons today. I mean, I watch the new cartoons that are out now. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, Spectacular Spider-Man, which ran maybe two years ago, something like that. Yeah. And that was an awesome storytelling. Um, also, I was a big fan of the Ninja Turtles series that came out, I think it was 03, maybe. And they went very, very close to, you know... Um, very close to stuff that uh, is borderline like adult content. Like in one episode, Leonardo actually slices off the head of Shredder, and it, then it's revealed that Shredder is actually a robot. Yeah, yeah. So, and um, I guess that's my pretty much my my barometer. I, I'm thinking, okay, can I see this on Cartoon Network? Can I see this in the Clone Wars? Can I see this on Adventure Time? And if it, if the answer is yes, I put it into the book. I mean, it's. I'm like, well, if parents are okay with the kids watching this on TV, maybe they don't know about it. But if they're okay with, you know, and if um, 
all these companies that are producing these shows are okay saying this is what's good for kids, then I sort of feel like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that into the book. Maybe I don't go as extreme as some of the stuff that I have seen on, on some of the shows, but, you know, uh, my one thing is definitely no gore and, of course, no swearing, obviously. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, and yeah, you do have to be careful. I, I've actually been taken to task by some parents because, oh, I'm getting a little bit of slapback from you, Mark. If you just, there we go. If you sure, i back. back. To, there we go. Cool. Thank you. Um, some parents took me to task because in the front, a character smokes. Okay. And, you know, right. and they're like, oh, gee, that's, you know, you're showing that as a normal activity. That's kind of bad. So some things, it's weird, right? It's like you have to really kind of be aware of what the social climate is because yeah. 15, 20 years ago, that would not have been a big deal in the comic, but nowadays it kind of is. Uh, but, yeah, I remember having a discussion when I was running the Sugary Cereals anthology when it was updating uh, where somebody wanted to show – uh, a dog biting somebody, and it was supposed to be very scary. It was like a demon dog biting a kid. And, then, you know, I had to think about that. Like, is that okay? And, and I thought really hard. I, I didn't want to edit this person's story and say, no, you can't have that happen. But at the same time, it's like you also have to measure, like, the difference between, I guess, like, the, the language I try to think about is, like, what's the difference between what's shocking and what's thrilling? Right. And it's okay to thrill, but don't shock. And so, like, if we, as long as we don't see those teeth penetrate human skin, we're okay. We, right. we know that dogs bite people and kids understand this and, and they should know that it's scary. Yeah. But we don't have to shock them with the actual gore of the dog biting the skin, right? Right. I mean, at least that's, that's, that's the rule of thumb I try to stick to. Yeah, I mean, like in the, there's one scene um, where the zombie, when the zombie first bites uh, Valerie's father, uh, on his hand, I actually, in the inking, there, there was blood. I had blood coming out. But um, once I got to Photoshop, I replaced that with just what looks like a, um, what looks like a zombie virus starting to spread yep. over. I'll pull it up in case they want to catch it on camera. But yeah, I don't know if we can actually see this. Where is it? It's like right there. Right. And so yeah, it looks like like zombie drool or zombie virus or something. Yeah, it's like more that. of the zombie virus catching into his hand and spreading. Also, art style figures into this a lot, don't you think? I mean, like, if you had drawn this in a very, like, you know, Steve McNiven, realistic art style, right. it would totally feel different that moment. But when you... Absolutely. It, was that intentional uh, to work in this kind of, like, very Cartoon Network, Craig McCracken-esque kind it's, of feel? I think basically because I can't draw that good as, <laughs> as uh, realistic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said, you said, no, I intentionally chose that style. <laughs> I've always just been a fan of just straight up just cartoony art, you know. If if I I want kids to understand this is a comic book. This isn't a telling of a, of an actual event. My one thing I always say is that for mypalmark.com, it's always escape into comics. You know, it's yep. it's a getaway from real life. So I rather have it look more cartoony, and I do everything in flats. I don't really have too much shading in any kind of my. Uh, any of my art because I want them to understand this is art. This is cartoons. This is comics. Right. It reminds me of the thing that Jack Kirby reportedly said at an art gallery. Uh, this is at the end of uh, Kirby, King of Comics, a uh, book by Mark Evanier. Yeah. Uh, where someone says, like, well, uh, too, ba too bad comics don't mirror reality. More people might understand them. And then he says, madam, comics don't mirror reality. They transcend reality. And that's the argument for you know, a more cartoony, more abstracted style, right, is because mm -hmm. it's elevated. It's not, it's, uh, it's defiantly unreal. It's, it's right. right? Um, speaking of that, speaking of your art style, I, I wrote down this as, like, my best description, my one-sentence description of what to expect from Flabbergast, and I don't know if this is going to be flattering or not. I hope you take it in the spirit it's intended. Uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets Word Girl. It's like the middle <laughs> ground between those two shows. Uh, so if you like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you like Word Girl, I know you'll like Flabbergast. That, that's, that's what I would tell people. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> I'll take that. Because, <laughs> I mean, it does feel like it's got that Buffy-esque feel of um, uh, being monster hunters. They're not just zombie fighters. I mean, there's, they're also fighting robots. They also go to other dimensions and fight right. uh, <laughs> Beartooth. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that's another thing altogether is I want to pick at this for a little while because we got about 15 minutes before uh, our ADL guest gets here. Um, resurrecting old characters, you know? Uh, so you, you've got characters in the story that you had since you were a kid. Uh, so how, how do you pronounce the frog character's name? 
Quag. Quag. But he was originally just Frog the City Samurai. Yeah. <laughs> and actually in the collection, the collected book that you did, uh, you actually posted the original comic that, yes. you, that you did when you were a kid. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, when I do school vids, kids get a kick out of that. They're yeah. like, wow, you know, and uh, to see that something that I drew when I was their age is something that I'm still using now is, uh, you know, it's it just opens up their mind. They're, they're like, oh, so I, I can do this. You know, I can create comics. And that's, that's, that's the reason I throw that in there. That's a good point. You know, going into a school and saying, hey, kids, you can be a professional and here's all the jobs you can do. That's kind of an abstract idea, right? It's like, well, you could be a storyboard artist for film. You could be, uh, you know, a, a character designer for video games. Okay, uh, I don't know what that means, right? When you're in third grade, fifth right. grade. But if you show them, here's how I drew when I was your age. Here's how I draw now. That's a concrete example of the evolution that can happen if you just. Drew and there's not much day. difference between mine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You know, I bet, I bet you, you know, it's a self-depreciating humor, but I bet you the kids, when they see you draw on a dry erase board, on a chalkboard, they think yeah. it's absolutely like magic when they see how easy yeah. it comes for you, right? Com comparatively speaking. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's kind of a sub point, but I think that's an important one to make, at least like for those who listen to the show who are librarians or teaching artists. Uh, that, that's the comparison that can actually make that, that concretized of, of here's what happens if you practice every day. Not, I, I, I went to a career day several years ago where the teacher had me in front of like, I don't remember what grade it was, but it was elementary school. And she was trying to get me to really sell these kids on a life in cartooning by pointing out all the fabulous career opportunities. And I obliged her, but I could tell I was boring the room. But then when I said, hey, who wants to see some drawings? You know, yeah. then it was suddenly like, oh, that's what we're interested in, right? We want to actually see what you can do with your skills, not sell me on exciting career opportunities, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I forgot where I was going now uh, with uh, talk. Oh, resurrecting old characters, right? So uh, you know, I've done this. I took a character that I made in fifth grade and did a new comic about them. Uh, so you, I'm guessing you're not the guy who goes back through everything you've ever done and just said that's garbage, throw it out. I don't ever want to look at it again. You actually hang on to all your old stuff, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I tell I tell everyone to do that. You know, you you just have to. And, and I actually like with Happy Lou the first. First uh, story in that, Balloon Flower. I think the, the art is just really not that good, but I kept it in there because I want people to not only, you know, to see the progression of my art. I think that's important. You know, I, I could have went back and redid the whole story in the new style, but I decided, no, let me leave it in there and explain later in the book that um, it's good to hold on to your things. It's good to, to see the progression that you can make as an artist or as a writer. And, and also, sometimes some of those old ideas can actually be worth revisiting years, Absolutely. years later. It's like I didn't know 10 years ago that uh, I would be, like, pulling out a character from 1986 when I was in fifth or sixth grade and I'd be doing a new story about him, you know? But sometimes that stuff you come up with, you know, at the time, you think, oh, that's not very good. But it can be actually pretty inspired when you look at it again years later. That's, that's sure. one reason to hang on to that stuff. But I like what you said about... Letting the world see your style evolve, you know, I mean, this is something I run into with a lot of young and beginning artists or cartoonists is this idea that their work has to be utterly consistent. And to which I say, gosh, what kind of life would that be if everything yeah. I drew was just the same as what I drew yesterday? That's one. It's impossible. You're always you're always going to get better. The more you draw, the more the more you, you know, progress. So, yeah, and that, that's the way it should be. Right. You know, absolutely. <laughs> at least we hope. But the other thing I think about is like, okay, so what, what, what is troubling them about this? They're anticipating that somebody's going to see their old stuff and not like it. When have you ever, I'll ask you this, when have you ever opened up a book and been like, oh, look at on page 75, it looks really good. On page two, it looks kind of bad. Too bad. I'm going to throw the book out. I'm never going to read this guy's stuff again. You know, have you ever like gotten upset about an artist? I think that's something we all yeah. implicitly understand is going to happen, right? Or no? Yeah. 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 I've, I've, yeah. <laughs> I, you gotta expect that, like we said. You know, you gotta expect that uh, it's gonna it's gonna get better. So, yeah, yeah, and and just because something is old doesn't mean that it is bad. It, it's a record of your work, and especially in the internet age, right, where right. all that stuff is you, you forget even what you put on a website after a while, after right. a couple years of doing it. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's why I posted my fifth grade comic online. I posted it on Google Plus, posted it on my website. I was like, yeah, look at this stuff. Look at where I came from, and uh, even posted some awful, awful mini comics I did in the in the early '90s. You know, and I don't, I can't stand to look at them, but somebody might enjoy them. Yeah. 
Um, so let's talk about uh, how you got these books published because uh, you used the old Kickstarter, which uh, for a while there was getting a lot of press. Everybody was talking about Kickstarter over the summer. Uh, yes. I think it feels like the news has died down a little bit. But you were using this. I mean, Flabbergast came out when, like, uh, last year, year before. Yeah, yeah. Um, what year was that? I'm, all the years just seem to fly by now. I, I know. Uh, Twenty ten. Okay, so a couple years, well, about a year ago now. So you were using Kickstarter when it was fa relatively new, uh, before all the hype started around it. Uh, what was your experience like with that? I mean, any any like takeaways of using Kickstarter to fund a trade paperback? I think it's definitely a, a great idea. You know, as long as you keep uh, you keep your um, prices like in the um, rewards list at a reasonable price. Like I, I did ten dollars, and you get a copy of the book. I did uh, twenty dollars, and you get a copy of Flabbergast and Happy Lou. And thirty dollars was Happy Lou, Flabbergast, and a shirt, something like that. You know, I had a lot of different levels where uh, people can jump in. And then I also went a little crazy. I went three hundred dollars, and I will paint you up a custom pair of Chuck Taylor All Stars. And lo and behold, I had someone. They they pitched in three hundred dollars. No way! Wow. Yeah. So I I did up the shoes. The shoes looked awesome. <laughs> I almost didn't want to give them up, but you know, deal was a deal. So I, I think it's uh, one of the main things you got to think about is keeping your video short. I'd say maybe two minutes or so, R really nothing too far over, and keep your rewards really good at a really reasonable price. And of course, you know, network. You got to be posting it on Facebook, but not too much. You don't want to be annoying. You know, you just ask people to help you post too, and hopefully have friends tell friends, and and hopefully get the word out there. Well, okay, so you were talking about the networking aspect, too. Uh, what about the person who does not have a lot of followers on Twitter, not a lot of friends on Facebook? They're just getting their feet wet in the social networking thing. Do you think that that is a vital component and they should uh, maybe hold back on using something like Kickstarter until they're more integrated into some groups? or? It is a little rough. Like I don't think I'm that huge, and you know, with all the social. But I mean, if you have, you know, you're looking at fr uh, families and friends, and you would think between them, at least they can tell maybe their closest friends. You know, if it, um, for Flabbergast, the other thing I'd, too for Kickstarter, I'd say aim low. Like for Flabbergast, I only asked for two thousand dollars because I didn't think I was going to get the full whatever it cost, maybe like four thousand or so to to print it up through Transcontinental. I, I figured it was going to be, you know, there's no way I was going to get that because, like I said before, I'm really not that big on all the social networks at the time. So I did aim low, and I, I did make did make the cut using my friends and using family contacts and stuff like that. Okay, okay. Well, that, yeah, that's another aspect to it. If you got a big family too, there's seven kids in my family, so I should have thought of that when I was doing nice. that. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, I, I liked what you said about the video too. Is that that's another one where sometimes I'll see like a seven-minute video, and, uh, and I'm I'm guilty of being the done, you know, after two minutes of just some sure. guy sitting behind a webcam. Uh, so yeah, that's another one. Uh, okay, so then the other the other thing that I want to touch base with you about is issue.com. This is something that it's been around for a while now, like what four years, five years, maybe. Yeah, and I'm surprised it really hasn't caught on as as big as I thought it would be, especially with uh, with us, like comic creators, you know, it's it's a beautiful looking site. Once you, you put your uh, comic into it, it's like you're actually flipping through the pages and everything. And, and for those listening to this after the fact, and uh, the, the show notes will be at comicsagreat.com slash CAG29, but uh, if you're listening and you want to get the link now, it's isuu.com, uh, it's, it's a web 2.0 name. But uh, yeah, so explain what issue is. Uh, it's it's it, Maybe it's the Flash business that makes people not use it too much, but it's it, it, maybe it, it is. It's a way to just, just load a. It's a PDF, right? Is that, you you load a PDF into there, and then it um just turns it into a, a digital book, and you can actually see it's a two page spread. So that works great for comics if you're talking about splash pages and stuff like that. It gives it a much better uh, view instead of maybe just a one page at a time on on a standard comic uh, comic press site. Yeah. You can actually see the two-page spread. You can see the layout of both both pages, and uh, you can flip through the pages. It's very easy easy to work and uh, easy to use. You can embed it onto the sites. Yep, so, that's how you got your archives on mypelmark.com, right? Right. Yeah, I put I put the flabbergast issues. I put the uh, <laughs> issues of them on onto the um, 
onto the Flabbergast page. But it's still in there as the regular form as it first appeared. It's still on uh, My Pal Mark through Comic Press, but it's also available through Issue. You know, it's another it's another avenue too for people to see your work and for you to share your work with people. Right, right, yeah, and and people can. It's got its own social components built in, which I've never really availed myself. Yeah, of. I, didn't, I didn't get too deep into it though. But but just in terms of the ease of use, you upload a PDF and then it's got this really nice spread display. Now, I, I, I'm guessing the only reason that it hasn't really taken off is because it is a flash embedded thing. I mean, oh. is, imagine that on a tablet. Imagine that on like an iPad or one of those right. other tablets. I mean, with that, especially with some people think the page flip thing is corny because it actually simulates a page flip. Yeah. But uh, I know lots of people who really get hung up on that kind of usability, user interface when they're using a book online. Some people want just the straight text experience of just let me push the page aside and another page shows up. Other people want to actually have like that page curl thing that happens. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I just I, every time I bring it up in a discussion with cartoonists, there's always like 60 to 70 percent of the people who are like, what's that? And I was like, wow, nobody uses it. So I was just wondering like why you decided to use it. It's just the ease of use thing for you. Pretty much. Uh, for a little bit, I was on. There was a site called Kidjitsu.com, and that was a uh, it was a collection of comic artists and comics just for kids. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. Unfortunately, the guy that was running he had a um, he just gave you know his he had a family come along. He had a, a birth of his son, so that took a little more. You know, he had to take care of that instead of working on the site. But it was a brilliant idea. And uh, I used to use that, and it was almost the same thing. I think you, I think they had the same kind of setup. And um, but I just I turned to issue.com, you know, for the same same kind of thing, the ease and the simplicity of it. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, somebody saying in the chat. Uh, well, I don't know how to pronounce that name. U K I I U K I I Yuki Yuki. Uh, it says the only problem I find is with those pop-up uh, spread things is the size. Yeah, that is an issue too uh, with issue. <laughs> is uh, yeah, when you got the spread, if it's embedded in a small space, you have to use the flash to zoom in in order to read it. So uh oh, right, right. Oh, Uki Uki. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that's how you pronounce that person's name in the chat. Uh, let's talk about some appearances. You got you're doing a tour apparently. Look, look at you, New York Comic Con coming up. Yes. Well, actually, coming up the, this weekend is the Geek Flea, which is right here in New Jersey, and it's a collection of uh, of comics and games, video games, and you know, homemade crafts and stuff like that, art. And I'll be doing, you know, I'll be selling the goods, selling uh, flabbergast, selling all, all my books, and doing some art cards of video game characters and paper bag puppets. And that's going to be in Kearney, New Jersey. I'll be putting up more uh, information on my site, and you can also go to unwinnable.com. And um, that's coming up, uh, like I said, this Saturday. And yeah, I'll be doing, I'll be partaking in 24 hour comic day. Are when you is gonna, that? When is that? That's October 1st. Are you going to do one that this time, Jersey? <laughs> uh, I don't know about October 1st. You, you never, did you ever? I've never done it. I've never done it. But you know what? This is something that I've mean to talk about with somebody because I've just been champing at the bit since I found it yesterday. Did you see that thing about um, Google Hangouts, the Google Plus Hangouts, how they're going to yes. open up the broadcast? So, okay, so for those who don't know who aren't on Google Plus, by the way, they just open it up to the public. Yeah. You can sign up if you really want. I'm there. Mark's there. Yes. Um, so they got this thing called Hangouts where you can have like a live video chat and it's like really intuitive and people can just pop in and pop out and like so I start and, and, and you have a lot of like granular control over who can actually be there and see that you've opened up a Hangout. Uh, I've I've messed around with Hangouts; they're super cool. Uh, but they but the one thing I was thinking about is like, boy, you know, this would be a really cool broadcasting mechanism. Um, yeah. A dream I've had for years is to, and I know some cartoonists do stuff like this is gather a group of cartoonists uh, who are all like-minded and like have similar tastes and sensibilities and do a 24-hour comic day wherever they are, but then stream it to a page where there's like, here's a tiled thing, Brady Bunch style tiled thing of all these different artists working and people could actually interact with them while they're working. That would be awesome. Keep their morale up, cheer them on, you know, because you know at hour 12, you're gonna be doing the, why am I doing this? I'm a hack, I'm no good and I should just go kill myself, right? Um, so how cool would that be? You'd have that social component, you have the social aspect, and then you also have the spectacle of watching artists work, which would be fun for people to check in and check out. Let's see how haggard Mark looks now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but now with that Google Hangouts thing, now they're off, uh, they're going to roll out this ability to do broadcasting from a Hangout. And I was like, damn, that's the perfect thing to do. It's free. There's no ads running over top of it. And you can have a tiled thing or, like, rather, a, you know, a whole bunch of 
social streams of or video streams of cartoonists working during 24-hour comic days. So it, if we could do something like that, pull something like that together, that'd be super fun. Then I'd that do it. That would be awesome. Count, count me in, Jerry. <laughs> yep, great. That would be, yeah, that would be really fun. I did not know it was coming up on October 1st. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it this year. <laughs> <laughs> I have such a baby about sleep nowadays. Oh. It's, there's no, you can still sleep. You can take a nap here and there. As long as you get the book done in 24 hours, that's all. <laughs> For those who don't know what we're talking about, what is it? It's uh, You get 22 pages in 24 20, hours? 24 pages in, 20, in 24 hours. An hour a page. Yeah, oh, I wonder if I could do that. Uh, do they? Does anybody uh, police very strictly what the page dimensions should be, or is that kind of no. open up nowadays? No, no, okay. you could do it. And I think there's even a web comic variation. I think it has to be a hundred panels or something like that. There's yeah, yeah. There's uh, all different kind of variations. I think on twenty four hourcomic dot com or maybe twenty four hourcomicsday.com, dot com, something like that. Um, Scott McCloud, and then I guess he issues out the exact. Um, Exact rules and regulations of of the uh, of the day. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> he's the arbiter of. Well, he's the inventor of twenty four yeah, hour comic right. day. You know, he did the first one. Oh, Jonathan Rector of JonathanRector dot com is in the chat, and he says that we should do that. That uh, the streaming of twenty four hour comic day. Okay, well, we'll look at doing it. I mean, I don't have. I don't know if I have the ability to do a, a broadcast of a Google Plus Hangout, but. Uh, you know, it, maybe maybe next time. I don't know. Is it is it annual or is it semi? Yes. Okay, so maybe next year or, or who knows? We could do an unofficial one. Yeah, uh, let's do it whenever. Yeah. So Eli's coming in. Let's get through your final uh, notes on your appearances where people can find you. You're also going to be at Wild Pig Con November fifth. What's that? Right, that's another local Jersey show. And then, um, um, yeah, at New York Comic Con, I'll be there with the guys from the Comic Book Diner. That's uh, John Gallagher. Jamar Nicholas and, uh, and and Rich Faber, and also I'll be with uh, Tom Zoller of LoveandCapes.com. Kids so, read comics so, regular, yeah. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to to uh, appearing with them. I mean, it's going to be a, a really fun time. My first time doing the New York Comic Con. I don't know. I've heard good things and I've heard bad things. So yeah, I'll see what it is. I mean, if it's really bad, then uh, <laughs> just just attend next year, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> You'll just politely refuse to talk about it when anybody brings right. it up. Right. <laughs> Uh, and then you're also going to be at the Miami, Miami Miami Book Fair. Was that where we first met? Was that the Miami Book Fair? Absolutely. Was yeah. it? Okay. Okay. I, yeah, I, I I figured that I knew you for a couple of years now, and I was trying to peg where I first met you because you were at I Kids Read Comics. Maybe three years, two or three years ago? Yeah, maybe 2008. Right there? 2008 was when I went. That is an awesome event. That is a yeah, seriously awesome fantastic. event. fantastic. For yeah. cartoonists. Yeah. So that's uh, November 18th through 20th. All these dates will be in the show notes. Uh, so then I'm going to run through the calendar real quick. Got some cool events going on at ADL. September 30th, Matt Fizell is going to be here. He's going to be doing uh, comics to screenplay from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at the downtown branch in the multipurpose room. Uh, he's going to discuss how he adapted his long-running comic strip, The Amazing Cynical Man, into a feature-length screenplay. Is now a soon-to-be-released film. So that'll be something to check out. October 2nd, ADL... The AADL Comic Artist Forum uh, is going on from 1 to 3 p.m. at the downtown uh, multipurpose room with Dan Mishkin of Kids Read Comics, uh, creator of Blue Devil, Amethyst Princess of Gem World, wrote Wonder Woman, Superman. Uh, guy's got a lot of wisdom to share. So he'll be there October 2nd from 1 to 3 p.m. And then October 16th, we're going to have an uh, Ann Arbor District Library Forum open lab in the computer lab where you can come in, digitize your artwork, and practice coloring it in Adobe Photoshop Elements. I'm going to be there to instruct the group. So a lot of awesome stuff going on at AADL. Speaking of AADL, here he is. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hey, how's it going, man? Here's my hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Eli Nyberger, Eulotricus. I always mispronounce Ulo it. Ulotricus. Ulotricus. Yeah. Ulotricus on the Twitters. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Worth following on the Twitter. So, uh, what do you got for us today? Well, I've really been enjoying your guys' conversation, as I as I always do. Uh, you know, I've got kids myself. I have a nine year old boy and a five year old girl, and um, you know, finding appropriate media for them, especially comics that they enjoy that aren't too syrupy, isn't easy. And I think yeah. that you guys were right on the money in that. There's, as part of kind of our overall parenting culture we really are trying to protect kids from ideas that are kind of native to childhood. You know, cruelty and bad things happening and all of that stuff, that is childhood and becoming an adult is growing out of that stuff. And I think that we're really kind of selling, you know, it, there's consequences I think of trying to protect our kids from all kinds of different types of badness in media 
when, you know, I mean, geez, the fairy tales, come on. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, there's a story about a wolf who breaks into your house and eats your grandma, <laughs> yeah. you know, and somehow we're worried about media being too rough for kids now at this point. Right. So along that line, I brought a couple different things here I wanted to kind of show off. You are so awesome. You're always bringing the books appropriate <laughs> to the conversation. God, that is, I appreciate that so much because uh, you did not know what I was going to talk about today. So. Well, but I was down there in my office watching. It wasn't hard to find out, you know. It's not like this is sequestered video. So I happened to find this thing, uh, which I haven't, I, I just looked at it and it's it's really cool. It's Fairy Tales of Oscar Wilde. And oh this is illustrated by P.K. P. Craig Russell, who does some really amazing work. Uh, he recently did a graphic novel uh, version of Coraline, which is, of course, not an undark story. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, of course, Gaiman is, you know, he he's not afraid of that stuff. But, you know, about getting everything you wanted at the cost of losing your parents, that's dark stuff, you yeah. know? And uh, so this is what this is. There's a series of five of these. And this one is called The Birthday of the Infanta. And it's beautifully drawn, and it's, you know, obviously Oscar Wilde wasn't avoiding the darkness of childhood. Right. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff in here. So this is a, a five-book series, beautifully drawn, and most interestingly, not particularly inspired by Grimm's fairy tales. Because this is kind of from before all of children's media evolved to wrap around the Grimm's fairy tales. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a different take on fairy tales. So that's pretty cool, especially, I think, for young girls. It gives them kind of uh, meaty adult themes, but presented, hey, there's princesses in this book. You know, so th it's got a, a lot of different things there. Now, another thing I brought, which is something I would imagine a lot of people know about, but I think there, if you're not a parent, you may not be aware. And this is the Little Lit series, which is put together by Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly, who is his oh, wife, yeah. who is also, the, I believe, the art director of The New Yorker. Um, so... This has got, this is like an all-star list. I mean, the first story in here is written by Lemony Snicket, yeah. Daniel Handler, and illustrated by Richard Sala. And it is a story about running away from home because your parents don't listen to you. And, wow. and that being a good choice that the character makes. So it's not, you know, <laughs> it's not being, it's not avoiding grittiness. The second story is something that's actually written, I think it's the third one, written by Neil Gaiman, illustrated by longtime great Gan Wilson, who used to draw for Playboy. And... <laughs> This story is about kids who can't play in their house because they're too noisy. So they decide to have a party in a graveyard, and the <laughs> zombies all come up, and they start playing with the zombies and teaching them. The zombies want to know if the kids know how to play Alexander's Whoop. whoops, Alexander's Ragtime Band. Uh, Did I hang up on him? I don't know. We'll Are see. you still there? I'm still here. Okay, there, there we, we go. go. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Touch the keyboard, I think. This also has uh, – it's got a piece by William Joyce in it, uh, you know, famous for, uh, uh, which is it, the uh, uh, the Christmas thing, the uh, Express. No, oh, no, 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 oh. I'm sorry. That's that's Van Allsburg. William Joyce, Roly Polioli, uh, uh, oh, you yes. know, and the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what the other, yeah, Roly Polioli was his big one. Mm -hmm. uh, this even has end papers by Martin Handford of Where's Waldo fame. Wow. So, I mean, it's just, this book is so beautifully put together. This, there's a story in here by Kaz. Uh, you know, Kaz, uh, of course, not really someone who does exclusively stuff for kids in his private life, although, you know, he does do uh, storyboards for SpongeBob and a lot of other shows. I believe Kaz has also worked on Adventure Time, if I remember correctly. And uh, then it's even got something by, what's his name from Mutz? Oh, uh, Patrick McDowell. Um, just, it's like a who's who of comics. It's got something by uh, uh, Eust Swart. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And then, totally shoehorned in, but the most awesome one in the whole thing, it's got something um, by Basil Wolverton. Wow. And it's, it's, a, it's a re... They, they just kind of threw in the theme, which is, was a dark and silly night. And they just said, it was a dark and silly night when Jump and Jupiter first heard the people of Dweep Weep. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> for me to expose my kids to this kind of 40s era, uh, 19, 1952, from Weird Tales of the Future... And it's basically, you know, Jumpin' Jupiter has magnetic ears and he goes to the planet of Oof and <laughs> lifts their law about no laughing. I mean, you know, this is, this is silly, but it's also about fascism. And it's a pretty interesting story. And, you know, Wolverton was definitely not one to avoid kind of the big meaty thing. So Little Lit, it's a whole series. There's another one called Strange Stories for Strange Kids. This is some of my kids' very favorite stuff. And it is extremely dark. And yeah. uh, I think that that's a good thing. And then <laughs> the other part is in the wonderful world of nonfiction comics, you guys are probably familiar with Rick Geary, who does just, I mean, I think, I don't know if there's anybody who does better line weights 
than Rick Geary in his illustrations. This book is called The Fatal Bullet. It's the story of the assassination of James A. Garfield. Mm -hmm. So this is history. This is true. Uh, you know, this isn't shelved in our youth book collection because you don't usually put things from a treasury Victorian murder <laughs> in the youth book collection. <laughs> but the fact is my nine-year-old read this and he loved it. It yeah. was really because, first of all, assassination of presidents, presidents is interesting. It's something that especially young boys really get into. And it tells the whole story. You can see there's like the, there's the map of where everything happened. It even has a drawing of Garfield's internal organs showing where the <laughs> bullet went. I mean, it doesn't shy away from it. I mean, here's the president lying on the ground in a pool of his own blood. Yeah, It's not you know, at the same time, it's not shocking like you were talking about before. Right. Because, I mean, this is history. This is what really happened. And what was most interesting to me about this is when my son read it, you know, and he just kind of like devoured it. And I was like, did you even really, really read it? And then he says, you know, the guy pulled the bullet, but it was the doctors that killed him. And I was wow. like, yes, that's exactly right. That's the lesson of this story is don't get shot in the late 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there, it's, it's a lesson we can all <laughs> take take to the grave. That's right. So um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, you know, Bubble Boy is of course adorable. There's lots of cute things for kids sure. that are marketed to parents, but I think you really miss out on uh, you know the transformative power of media and especially comics to present uh, you know scary stuff in a safe way. Uh, I mean, I was looking over flabbergast while you guys were talking, and you know, I mean, th you're right. These are that's scary stuff. It's very <laughs> cool, but it's presented in such a yeah. non-threatening format. Yes, you know that it's. I mean, I can. I know that my kid will be less scared of this than he is of Plants vs. Zombies, because in Plants vs. Zombies, it's very clear what happens if you fail. They eat your brain, yeah. not someone's brain. Your, your brain. brain. They yes. break into your home and they eat your brain. This is about someone else. You know, this is yeah. about other people and it's okay to see what happens to them. And, you know, and I think that uh, especially with thinking again of Lemony Snicket, with the series of unfortunate events, it showed that there's big money in dead parents. I mean, yeah. ba Batman knows that, <laughs> you know, so I think it's, it's interesting that at the same time that we've kind of got this culture of kiddie media. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that breaks through. And frankly, I think that uh, you guys are talking about the cartoons. I think the, the um, uh, Friendship is Magic is very much a part of that, where, you know, there's some bad things happen in that. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, well, Discord, the big bad guy, right? You mm -hmm. know, the, the weird evil dragon. And I think that a big part of that show's success is that it isn't, it's, you know, it's not exclusively syrupy. It's got right. a lot of depth to it. And it has bad things happening. One of the most memorable episodes of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe for me was an episode about uh, a guy who gets paralyzed because he shoots a gun to try to stop a bad guy and he causes a rock slide and it paralyzes him. And then he says in the episode, uh, I was one of the lucky ones, some people didn't make it out at all. Now, as a kid in the early 80s, I was like, whoa, can you say that on TV? Because remember G.I. Joe, every right, time right, right. a plane blows up, you see a parachute. That's right, right. You can't say death. You can say destroy him. You can't say kill him. But they said explicitly in that episode, people died. And then it was all about this boy deciding whether or not he wants to become a soldier. And, they, and the amazing thing they did in that episode is they didn't make a value judgment. They didn't say whether fighting was wrong or right. They said... When you fight, there are consequences, and that's up to you to decide whether or not you want to do that thing. But this is what happened to me, and this is what happens with He-Man. He-Man doesn't get hurt, but I got hurt. It could happen. And then they reiterated with the moral and everything, but I was just I was astonished that they had that much presence of mind to not say, remember, kids, don't fight because, oh, gosh, if we say that fighting is okay, they're going to fight in the playground, and then parents are going to sue. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, it's, it's that whole fear of what are the kids going to do with this. But, yeah, let's face it, all of us, when we're on the playground, kids do nasty things to a kid. Right. What's worse than a fifth grade kid that's right. to another fifth grade yeah, that's kid? That's where it comes from. Yeah, yeah, so for sure. I wonder if they'd be able to make that same episode today. You know, in that, in that if the uh, the money process behind cartoons, because I was I was reading an article about Friendship of Magic recently where uh, Lauren Foss was saying that people thought that uh, the characters were going to be too annoying. You know, that they thought the Pinkie Pie was going to be, you know, mm -hmm. like not an acceptable character. And they thought that uh, that uh, Applejack was making fun of country people, you know. <laughs> and she really had to fight for this to have this kind of diversity in the main characters. Wow. You know, and it's just you can really see. And I think that uh, while you can't argue with success, getting to that point is really the hard part. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's it's. 
it's amazing that some of the shows and some of this media got produced in the first place in this kind of market of 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 going with the safe as opposed to to the good you know oh so yeah with going stuff. with the focus groups i mean i've worked on intellectual properties where there's been focus groups because they're worried about how are the parents going to take it right and then you get bizarre input like well uh people with curly hair uh, this is honest to god I, I got this remark from a focus group people with curly hair are rich could you make her hair straight because we want this to skew towards poor people they honestly said that to <laughs> me <laughs> Yeah, that's really? how that that is how like laser beam focus they get about minutia that has nothing to do with anything. Wow. I know lots of Ulogicus <laughs> people that are not rich, so that's that's <laughs> really yeah, that's crazy. But but yeah, but that's the kind of like watered down, silly, bizarre stuff that can ruin. It, you're yeah. right; it, it is amazing that anything gets made sometimes, especially in Hollywood, yeah. right? So. Uh, Mark, do you, did you have any recommended reads for us? Or I mean, I kind of threw this one at you last second, so yeah, sure. I'm, I'm a fan of the show, so I know it's. <laughs> <a good time. laughs> I would definitely recommend Amelia Rules. It's, ah. yeah, it's definitely um, another great comic that does not talk down to kids, and it's all about kids. And the one thing I love about this series is that she grows up. You know, you actually are with her as she grows up. A lot of comic characters, I mean, look at Charlie Brown. He was the same age forever. Bart Simpson. Uh, Amelia McBride, she, she grows up, and it's about, you know, parents are divorced. It's about uh, living with a rock and roll aunt and everything. So it's a, it's a really great read. I highly recommend Amelia Rules by Jimmy Gownley. Also, uh, Buzz Boy by my friend John Gallagher and Rich Faber. Another really cool, it's a superhero action-packed, fun time comic for, you know, for all the kids out there and, and, uh, and adults. And then um, one more as far as, um, I wouldn't say it's mostly for kids, but I don't know if you, if you it's, this is a fist, stick, knife, gun. And it's the story of Jeffrey Canada, and it's told by um, Jamar Nicholas, and it's uh, adapted by him. And it's a, it's a pretty much about growing up on the streets of New York and basic survival for for a kid, a young kid, and uh, as they graduate from fist to a stick to a knife, and then even to a gun. And so it's a it's a wonderful wonderful story. But again, it does feature some violence. It does feature some swearing. Um, but it is a wonderful read for maybe teens and up. Okay, cool. Wow, I didn't expect you to have so many. And yeah, Buzz Boy. <laughs> I got a second you on Buzz Boy. That is, that is a, a great, great comic with awesome aesthetic to it and lots of really fun energy. So Yeah, and I want a second Amelia Rules. I almost grabbed that on my way up. Because for, that, <laughs> for those exact reasons, that she's just a, a really real character and yeah. really is very relatable to kids. It's, and, and also one of those... Uh, well, again, similar to Twilight Sparkle, it's okay to be smart, girls. It's okay to be smart, girls. Don't forget. Yeah, Th yeah that is awesome. Okay, well, is there anything else that we wanted to mention? Any plugs going on? Anything going on at ADL that you wanted to? Well, I think if you're not already playing Treasure Quest, you should be playing Treasure Quest, and that's at play.adl.org. What's, what's going on with that? Treasure Quest is our. Uh, it's inspired by Ready Player One, which is Ernest Klein's new book. And man, if if you lived in the '80s, you need to read Ready Player One. There's just no question about it. It is one of the most exciting and fun uh, kind of novels of a terrifying dystopia that I've ever read. So uh, it comes highly recommended. So uh, I, and I built this kind of set of super hard puzzles to take our summer game audience and keep them, keep them engaged. Uh -huh. uh, so each month, on the first of each month, we'll drop a new clue about a different key. You've got to find the key. You've got to find the gate. You've got to figure out how to combine the key and the gate to clear the gate. Uh -huh. And uh, each person who who achieves one of these things gets one fewer point than the person before them. So, like, there's a leaderboard and oh, you know, wow. all this stuff. That's all inspired by the book, okay. which is all about basically it's kind of a cross between Willy Wonka and uh, – um, I'm not sure what else. It's it, because it has a golden ticket. It's, it's basically Willy Wonka meets Snow Crash, is for lack of a better word. Okay. Uh, so it's a really great book, and I totally stole the idea for this treasure quest. So <laughs> check it out at play.aadl.org. Play.aadl.org. Okay, awesome. So, uh, Mark, anything else that you wanted to mention before we go? Uh, I guess just mypalmark.com. Um, uh, Flabbergast is actually running now with a deeper creator commentary on unwinnable.com. And it's starting to get a, a lot of good feedback over there, and it's a and this is this is a site I'd say that's even you know not just for kids, you know maybe not always family friendly. So that's another good thing, showing that Flabbergast does appeal to a, adults as well as as kids. And so every Wednesday 
I'm doing a deeper creator commentary for each page about, you know, maybe my process or something of how it relates to, you know, uh, the creation process and stuff like that. And that's at unwinnable.com. We're going to have to have you back again because I want to talk more about that, the, 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 the adding layers of content on top of the, the original context. I think that's a fascinating topic. Uh, no, absolutely. So, yes, yeah, so uh, mypelmark.com. Thank you so much, Mark, for being here. Thank you, Eli. Hey, for no problem. Us put this on. Oh, yeah, yeah, nice to meet you, Mark. So, yes, yeah, nice to meet you, Eli. Ulotricus on the Twitters. Yep. Mark, where can we find you on Twitter? Uh, my pal Mark on Twitter. Um, you can Facebook my pal Mark and um, Mark Mariano on Google Plus, <laughs> Tumblr my pal Mark. So so yeah, good branding, yeah. Just it's my... easy, easier to find. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. So all right. Thanks everybody for downloading and listening. We'll be back next Wednesday at twelve thirty p.m. Eastern uh, at comicsgreat.tv. Until then, I've been Jersey Joe's of jdoes.com. Jersey on the Twitters. Okay. Bye.